Although March 4, 1789 was the appointed day for the first meeting of the first Federal Congress, it wasn't until the 6th of April that Virginia's Richard Henry Lee arrived and the Senate achieved a quorum. The House had begun work four days earlier, and not surprisingly, their attention was quickly focused upon the imperative need to raise revenue for the operations of the federal government. Understandably, they turned first to taxing imported goods, as well as laying duties on the tonnage of ships import that imported those goods. This new rev revenue system would need to be administered in every U.S. port through which it imported goods passed. And by July 31st, the Congress had passed and the Congress had signed an act to regulate the collection of the duties imposed on the goods, wares, and merchandises imported into the United States. This act authorized the creation of a relatively small bureaucracy. Ports of entry and delivery were established and revenue officers were authorized. <clears throat> Thus, our federal customs system, patterned after that which had been practiced in the state, was born. On August 3rd, the president, who clearly had been working on his list of nominations for the offices before the act passed Congress for his signature, conveyed his list of nominees to the Senate. This is the point where Benjamin Fishbourne enters the story. He's the president's nominee for naval officer at the port of Savannah, Georgia. Like most Americans, Fishbourne, who held this position under the state government, had assumed ahead of time that George Washington would be elected president. Thus, in September 1788, he had made an early appeal to Washington for the nomination to this position before it was even established. Though his, this letter hasn't been located, Washington's December 23, 1788 response recognizes Fishbourne's distinguished career in the Revolutionary War, including four years as the aide-de-camp to General Anthony Wayne. Without making any commit commitment to nominate Fishbourne, Washington was always very noncommittal, and that was wise on his part. Uh, in May of 1789, Wayne himself wrote to Washington requesting that Fishbourne be continued in his Savannah position. And in hindsight, Wayne's words might have been a warning to Washington of problems to come. Wayne stated that Fishbourne replaced Reuben Wilkinson, who was suspended for malpractice, but that Wilkinson planned to appear at the seat of government to seek the appointment and would very probably be recommended by a Mr. Gunn, who now holds a seat in the Senate through the intrigues of Mr. Wilkinson. We haven't actually found any evidence that Wilkinson appeared in New York City during the first Congress. Nevertheless, James Gunn of Georgia is the other individual whose name will always be linked with Fishbourne's and the, orig and the origins of senatorial courtesy. Before continuing the story, I want to add a little relevant procedural background that went on before the Senate considered this nomination. First, at the Senate at this time held both its legislative and executive sessions in secret. The bare bones legislative journal was printed at the end of each session, but the journal where executive business was recorded remained secret for decades after the end of this Congress. That journal tells us that on June 18th, before considering the nomination of William Short to replace Thomas Jefferson as U.S. Minister at the Court of France, the Senate had established a rule that the consent of the Senate to the President's nomination of officers be given by ballot, which means it would be public. Immediately after the nominations for revenue officers were received on August 3rd, some senator made a motion to reconsider this rule, which the Senate disagreed to. A motion to wait on the President of the United States and confer with him on the mode of communication proper to be pursued between him and the Senate on the formation of treaties and making appointments was then introduced and postponed to August 4. Then another motion to dispense with balloting upon the present occasion and to, cons to consider the nominations before the Senate via Vivosi 
vote, uh, voice vote. That, that failed. I, hadn't, I admit that I hadn't thought too much about um, these motions and attempts to modify the rules until I began piecing the evidence together for the Fishbourne story. And it dawned on me that these motions almost certainly were attempts by Senator Gunn to conceal the action that he intended to take. Following these motions on rules, the Senate agreed to proceed by ballot, a caveat being assented to that it should not be considered as a precedent. During the balloting on August 3rd and 4th, all the president's nominees were considered and approved except for those of Georgia, which were postponed. On August 5th, the Senate approved the Georgia officers except Fishbourne, whose nomination was rejected. Samuel A. S Senate Secretary Samuel A. Otis was directed to lay a certified copy of the proceedings, which would not have included a record of the votes before the President of the United States. None of the official records reveal either the reason for Fishbourne's rejection or exactly what happened next. They do tell us that, the fo that following the Fishbourne vote, a motion that it is the opinion of the Senate that their advice and consent to the appointment of officers should be given in the presence of the president was postponed until the next day. On August 6th, the resolution proposed on August 3rd to appoint a committee to confer with the president on the subject of executive communications was agreed to. And Senators Ralph Izzard of South Carolina, Rufus King of New York, and Charles Carroll of Maryland were appointed. And the Sec Senate Executive Journal for August 7th prints a letter from the President in which he nominates Lachlan McIntosh as the Savannah Naval Officer. He then appeals to the Senate to consult him in cases when the propriety of the nomination appears questionable to them so he can provide the information that caused him to make the appointment nomination. Washington concludes by defending his nomination of Fishbourne. He relates Fishbourne's military service, calling his behavior at the Battle of Stony Point active and brave, and discusses all the positions of Georgia gover in government service to which Fishbourne had been selected. In his concluding sentence, Washington used and underlined the word confidence four times in stressing the good opinion that militia officers Georgia, Freeman, and the Georgia Assembly and its councils must have had a fishborn to appoint, if they had appointed him to several positions of trust. An August, 10, an August 10th motion to commit this message was postponed until after the Committee on Executive Communications reported, and Fishborn's name doesn't appear again in the official, the official records. So you have to turn to the unofficial records to flesh out the story. Historians who study the first Congress <coughs> rely upon Senator McClay's diary for both insider information about the Senate and insights into the actions of this formative body. As the editors of McClay's diary, which makes up most of volume nine of the documentary history of the first federal Congress, I have to tell you that Senator Byrd can, he can actually recite from McClay's diary. He's memorized a good part of it, which was very exciting to hear him do that for us at a party one time. <laughs> um, the editors of the diary have called uh, McClay's diary caustic, sometimes witty, and generally self, or generally accurate self-analytical diary that stands behind James Madison's notes on the Federal Convention as the most important journal in American political history. We count on McClay to reveal much that went on behind the closed doors of the Senate. At the same time, we must be constantly wary of his biases, particularly when he becomes more and more disillusioned with the Federalists' agendas in the second and third sessions. Unfortunately for us, McClay was on sick leave at or traveled to and from his home north of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania from July 20th through August 15th. And thus he wasn't present to provide us with a first-hand account of what happened on the day that Fishbourne's nomination was rejected. 
Nevertheless, he does report on an August 16th conversation with Senator Izzard, where Izzard related that the president showed great want of temper when one of his nominations was rejected. And that's kind of the first clue that Washington actually went to the Senate. Izzard, who chaired the Committee on Executive Communications, also reported to McClay that the president told the committee that he had consulted members of the House on the subject of nominations, but he had not acted so with the senators as they would have the opportunity of giving their advice and consent afterwards. It seemed clear from both what Izzard reported to McClay and the letter that he sent the Senate that the president thought the word advice implied a dialogue with the Senate when doing executive business, and that's really not a bad interpretation. While McClay's report on the conversation with Izzard is the only contemporary evidence that we have that Washington reacted with anger to Fishbourne's rejection, fortunately we have located a later and more revealing account of the incident. In an unsigned letter of March 12, 1818, to Joseph Gales, Jr. and William Seaton, who were the publishers of the National Intelligencer, Benjamin Lincoln Lear, the son of Washington's longtime personal secretary, Tobias Lear, related what we believe to be his father's version of what happened when the president learned of the vote on Fishbourne. Lear was apparently trying to set the record straight after Gales and Seaton published a different version of the story, which we haven't located. Though Lear's letter states that he believed that it was the nomination for collector of the Port of Charleston that was rejected, it's clear that he's discussing the Fishbourne incident. Lear reports that as soon as Washington learned of the Senate's August 5th action, he immediately repaired to the Senate chambers and entered to the astonishment of everyone. Vice President Adams gave up his chair for the president and he sat who sat and then said that he had come to ask the Senate's reasons for rejecting Fishbourne. Lear states that after many minutes of embarrassing silence, General Gunn rose and said that since he had been the person who had first objected to the nomination and it, he had probably been the cause of his rejection, it was perhaps his office to speak on this occasion. That his personal respect for the character of General Washington was such that he would inform him of his grounds for recommending this rejection, and he did so, but that he would have it distinctly understood to be the sense of the Senate that no explanation of their motives or proceedings was ever due or would ever be given to any President of the United States. Lear also reports that he was told that Washington returned from the Senate chamber and express great regret, regret for having gone there. We, though we don't have any documentary evidence for exactly why Gunn vetoed Fishbourne's nomination, um, it could have been because got, uh, Fishbourne got the job that Gunn's friend had, but there's also some other background. Gunn and Fishbourne had been fellow, fellow officers during the Revolutionary War. Fishbourne had attempted to go, to deliver Gunn's challenge to a duel to Nathaniel Green in 1785. Green had declined this challenge. An undated letter from Fishbourne to an unknown recipient describes an affair of honor between himself and Gunn. And according to this letter, the duel, this duel was stopped by the interference of the seconds. Um, so clearly there was some bad blood between the two men, though they probably had been friends at one time. One also ends up with a picture from these descriptions of, uh, of Gunn as a man with a rather volatile personality. So the first nearly contemporary indication we have found of Senator Gunn's involvement in the rejection, uh, because that Lear letter was quite a bit later, uh, is a letter from New York to Fishbourne, which appeared in the August 27th Georgia Gazette. The author reports that even though Fishbourne was warmly supported by Mr. Robert Morris of Pennsylvania, who is your friend indeed, he was strongly opposed by Gunn and William Few, the other Georgia senator, and states, 
They were frequently called about by your friends in the Senate for their reasons. Gunn urged nothing of consequence but personal invective and abuse. The president, General Washington, was so particular as to give his reasons for the Senate, to the Senate for nominating you, all of which were honorable. Gunn and few have gained nothing by this maneuver, and I am happy to say that their conduct will have no weight with your friends in depreciating your responsibility or integrity, for you are far better known than either of them on the broad basis of public transactions during the revolution. Nevertheless, Fishbourne didn't get the job. Uh, a few days later, General Wayne wrote to South Carolina Representative Adanis Burke, stating that Gunn had prevented his, for his former aide, meaning Wayne's former aide, from being elected to office with an illiberal, false, and malignant attack upon his character, and asked him to put a certificate signed by the gentleman of distinction at Savannah before the senators. 